Hi, everyone. We will get ourselves underway. I know we uh, have a lot of busy people on the line and, uh, you know, as we get the introductions underway, uh, you know, our numbers will continue to climb. Uh, so a big welcome to our panellists. Uh, I'm Louisa Wilson. Uh, I head up our global enterprise customer acceleration team where we've really been looking at how could we bring thought leadership to our valued customers uh, throughout the world over the last uh, few months as we've faced uh, this global crisis and pandemic together. Uh, I, I am going to leave it on and say that uh, this will be our last of the Talent Continuity Learning Series and we will be taking a break over July and August and uh, recharging the batteries and coming back with what we're going to call our uh, New Ways for Talent Executives Series uh, right after the summer here in Europe. And, you know, what's been fantastic to see over the last few months is that we've had more than 6,000 people attend these webinars that we've held. We just confirmed we did have five uh, webinars across two time zones, so 10 in total, uh, and we did have 6,000 6, people join us. So we're really excited that we were able to um, support everyone and bring, uh, you know, in insight and thought leadership and support uh, during, during the crisis. Uh, well, who I'd like to introduce today is our special panel, if we go to slide two, is that uh, we've got some, some special guests here today. We have Anka Gayantan. Anka has 20 years experience in Randstad, and we are going to talk about uh, workforce and talent agility today. And uh, Anka is extremely agile during this pandemic. And after you know years of experience in many of our business concepts for Randstad, uh, she took up the role of really as the strategic program owner of Safely Back to Work for Randstad. And how have we really navigated uh, the pandemic and how can we help people back into work with uh, really robust safety protocols that supports not only our business, but you know, most importantly, supports industry and customers alike. So really excited, Anka, for the thought leadership you're going to bring to us today and not only what the protocols are, but how that has led to a, really a transformation of our workplace today. Uh, we are also joined by Yvette Rohir, who is our, uh, one of our great SVPs within Ransett Enterprise Group. And Yvette has been in the HR industry since 2002, so we have some wonderful HR uh, veterans with us today. I promise not to call Yvette old, <laughs> <laughs> like she said, but, uh, you, know, we, you know, Yvette has had uh, a deep levels experience working with major global organisations uh, in relation to what is their strategies uh, for talent acquisition. And I think predominantly at this point, in time has been providing guidance and advice in how to navigate whether it's scaling down or scaling up. So Yvette, thanks for joining us today. And finally, we have Alison Demerol, who is again one of our SVPs from Randstad Enterprise Group and uh, brings again another 24 years experience in the industry. We have some uh, veterans with us today who's going to share amazing amounts of insights in terms of uh, how we can really drive and shape, uh, our, you know, uh, safely return to work, but also what is the new normal going to look like? So uh, Alison has great experience across driving large accounts, but also uh, is a, as a trusted total talent advisor within the industry uh, based out of North America. So welcome uh, today to Ali. I will try and call you Alison, but I might have to revert to Ali. That's how I... Ali is fine. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, to get us started today um, on the agenda, what we have is uh, Anka's going to give us a great insight into an update on the HR Industry Alliance that Ransett has been really proud to uh, support and drive uh, that's really looked at how can we support businesses and economies uh, safely get back to work and, you know, what does work look like in the new normal? Uh, she'll then follow and provide a, you know, a really great uh, range of insight into what has shaped some COVID-19 protocols across the globe and what have we actually learned from um, you know, working with 450 companies to shape these protocols? How can companies minimise risk? But also, how is it going to uh, really leverage and drive what will be our new normal ways of working for you know, months and probably years now to come? And then we will uh, dive into a really great conversation with Anka, Ali and Yvette in relation to, you know, the key HR trends that are really shaping up not only workforce strategy of today, I think we've all can realise we've been through an unprecedented, uh, you know, time and challenges and, you know, we've really had to look at different ways of working and those ways of working will predominantly now become the new normal. So we've had a great look into our talent and really identified some of the trends that have accelerated as a result of the pandemic and what will those shifts now look like for organisations as they navigate the months uh, months ahead. So I'm um, gladly going to hand over to Anka now who's going to lead us uh, in the update around the Industry Alliance and Protocols. All right. Thank you, Louisa, and uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining uh, today's uh, call. 
Um, so yeah, let me talk to you about, uh, of course, the alliance that we've formed. As you all know, the COVID pandemic has imposed enormous challenges to people and economies around the globe. And um, the HR services industry actually represents the world's largest private sector employer. And we have a lot of people that we place at work in, uh, in many, many countries altogether. And we have together also a lot of labor market expertise. So the three leading HR companies across the globe, Ronstadt, ADECO, and Manpower, they spearheaded an initiative to form an alliance. And the aim of the alliance really was to expedite getting people safely back to work and businesses and economists to start running again. And the vision of the alliance is that we really need collaboration among governments among employers, uh, sector federation, trade associations, and also, of course, the HR industry. Everyone needs to establish protocols, policies, practices that keep people safe and give them the tools they need to do their job. So let me move to the next slide and explain to you what the Alliance is doing. First of all, we reached out to companies across the globe and asked them for their COVID age health and safety measures that were defined. And this was extremely insightful. You might think that's quite difficult for us to do. We would send out a survey to many companies. No, that's not, that's not the case at all. Because in, let's say in our day-to-day -day business, we have these documents. When we place people as a temporary worker in a large workforce environment, we always go through the safety procedures with our clients and we discuss what we need to do to ensure the safety of their work. Do they need to wear helmets? Do they need to have specific clothing? Do they need training? How do we make sure that they can safely do the job? So we collected, um, I must say, almost 400 measures in the COVID uh, protocols of these companies in what we call a global grid, a spreadsheet. And we really uh, first started with key sectors but when we were started and when we uh, uh, moved on with the program we added more and more sector specific protocols and we agreed with the initial alliance partners how can we categorize all these measures so we can quickly remove any duplicates look into the unique measures that have been put in place across the globe and we define uh, things like looking into the risk control levels and i'll explain more about that later on um, the type of measures, uh, is it something personal? Is it something you have to do as an employer? Um, is it sector specific? Is it country specific? Those type of categorizations. And the results was captured in a booklet, which now contains 110 measures. But as I said, we went on and captured more and more protocols because also governmental policies changed and protocols changed when we moved on. The information and data we captured was extremely powerful. I was asked to join the Dutch expertise group to advise the government outbreak management team. Um, but also in other countries, we saw that sharing the information was extremely useful. If an uh, automotive company had planned in shifts of workers in a new way, companies that were manufacturing food were interested to learn how these shifts were organized. Reinventing the wheel was not necessary and we also truly felt it could help economies and businesses across the globe. So let's move to the next slide and I can tell you what a good protocol looks like. Of course this is the first thing that we learned. What is common practice in companies protocols? As an alliance or as Ronstadt we never sat down and said let's think about what goes into these protocols. What do we think? What are we doing in our offices? We didn't do that. We just collected, collected, collected across the globe, all the protocols. And we quickly saw that these chapters actually form uh, a good book, a good protocol book. Um, first of all, there's some general instructions for each target group, which is relevant for the company. What do you need to inform your employees about washing their hands, staying at home when they're sick, those type of things. What do you need to explain to the employer, the managers of the business? What do they need to do? Your clients, your visitors, your suppliers, and maybe other areas like an educational institution might have some specific guidance for students, for teachers, 
etc. Then we saw that protocols have a list of measures, starting from general health measures, stay at home, or when you do get sick at work, what do you do? And we learned in these measures that companies consider different levels of risk in a protocol. To give you an example, say you establish that the canteen or company restaurant is an area of risk. Do you completely close it, so eliminate the risk, or do you keep it open and just say, let's limit the number of people in it? And we define a seating arrangement, or maybe we should eat in ships. Maybe we should have food delivery come in. So there was different resolutions to the same problem. We also saw that there were measures around traveling. How do you get to work? What do you do when somebody's been abroad? And on training, on onboarding, how do you do that when you've enforced in your protocol that people work remote? What's important that you also consider how the communication is done. How do you tell people? How uh, do you inform them through a newsletter, instructions, training, signs, banners? But also, of course, how do you make sure the protocol is enforced, that you can actually monitor that the measures are put into effect? What was interesting to see is that in these protocols, some preconditions had definitely been taken into consideration when these companies made these protocols. Is public transportation available? Is the supply chain still open? If we write in the protocol, everybody needs to wear a facial mask. Do we need to hand them out? Do we need to buy them? Do we expect people to buy them? Those type of things. And also, what happens when policies change? This list actually helps us to support companies for which protocols are completely new, especially in smaller businesses that never have written up protocols for the safety of their workers. They were very happy to get a list of measures and to consider just the regular workspaces like meeting rooms, reception areas, uh, elevators, those type of environments, and learn from the larger companies for which this is already a best practice for many years. But also large workforce companies really said, we're happy to understand what others have done because we could be interested and learn from our peers. Let's talk more about the hierarchy of controls and move on to the next slide. We use the following model for categorizing all the measures in the global grid. This is the commonly used health and safety expert framework, and it's used across the globe. When you need to mitigate risk of workers in a specific work environment, ideally, you start at the top of the pyramid from a risk perspective. You would say, let's just completely eliminate it. So for COVID-19, that would mean, let's just completely close the business. And in some cases, government policies actually impose this. Hairdressers were said, you cannot be open. And events were completely cancelled. This was, of course, very safe. But it's not good for business. Moving down the pyramid, you'll see the second level is substitution. This has actually caused the effect that in many protocols, of many companies, people in office environments were asked to work from home. From a risk perspective, this is perfect. You cannot be infected at the workplace, but of course, you need digital tooling to enable people to, to do their work. From a risk perspective, it was the best resolution, and that's why it's so commonly adopted. Then you'll see there's some engineering controls. This is where you physically change the workplace. If you are running a manufacturing environment, you can't say, work from home. You need to physically make sure that people can keep a distance. So, plexiglass barriers were installed on assembly lines, and I'm sure you've all seen it in your supermarket at the cash register, that you have these barriers that make sure that the disease doesn't spread between a client and a worker. The fourth category is administrative controls, and that's really about changing the way people work. Give instructions. Don't walk here. Limit the number of people in an elevator those type of things. And you hope that people listen to you and actually do what you've instructed them to do. And from a risk perspective, the, mo the least effective is actual personal protective equipment, PPE. Uh, from a company perspective, it's probably is the easiest thing to do because you don't have to change a thing. You don't have to instruct anybody. You just say, this is what you need to do. 
In some environments, of course, protective e equipment is a common practice for years. Think about your dentist or a life science re research lab, but also think about how these people have been trained to use facial masks and those uh, other gloves um, and having a, a, a high hygienic standard in place. That actually also costs money for a company to do. Let's move to the next slide and show you how these controls have given you more insights. As I said, uh, the protocols have measures for different workspaces for companies. And the good news is that the, the risk control levels, the categorization that we applied to the grid really helped us for other companies to be able to quickly compare what their resolution was as compared to another company. Think about, for example, the entrance. We saw in the protocol grid that there's a lot of ways you can make sure that workers are at the entrance area. You see some are actually closing areas, some are doing a medical screening before they go in, some have some sort of crowd control to prevent congestion and give certain instructions. Um, but for other areas, like uh, a walking route, there's only two resolutions that companies took across the globe. They either made wider footpaths or they put up some signs and banners to separate the flows of people. You come into the left and you move in and you go out at the right. So this is where companies can really quickly check what have my peers done. So to summarize what we can do with it, let's move to the next slide. As I said, with all these insights, we can help companies that don't have a protocol yet. We can share our insights. We have templates and checklists based on all the measures that we captured from companies across the globe. And we have, of course, a lot of peer examples. For those that have a protocol, we can do a protocol scan. We can actually check per chapter, not only what's in your protocol, but also how do you compare as uh, when we look into those risk levels that have been applied. Now I'd like to tell you more about the overall insights that we got from gathering all this protocol information in our global grid. Let's move to the next slide and I'll talk to you more through the insights. As I said, we captured from all these companies their uh, protocol information and 140 unique measures are today in the uh, spreadsheet that we've created. And we see that 65%, so the majority is relevant for all industries. It's not really sector specific. And that's why it's so good to share it and to take that collaborative, collaborative approach across the globe. We can learn from other sectors and we can learn how they've resolved the safety of their workers. And even more so, 90% are actually relevant for all countries. There's only a little bit of difference when it comes to uh, temperature screening being allowed before you enter or using certain apps. But all other things, are actually commonly shared. We can definitely say that the biggest impact of COVID-19 protocols for companies are in the non-production area. This is where most measures have been taken. So they're specific for white collar and alpha environments. And for the risk perspective, we saw that most fall into the category of administrative controls, meaning we change the way people work, as well as some engineering uh, changes where we actually physically had to change the, the, uh, the office environment or manufacturing environment. And we feel that this really forecasts the new way of working because it includes both human and workplace adaptations to make sure we keep safety at work. I'd like to tell you more about that in the next slide. We definitely can say that similar work environments have similar protocols. There's two things that we can actually look into. Look here and you will see that you can actually look at a work environment and think about how long and how close people interact in the work environment, which we call interaction proximity. You can also see what are the number of contacts in a typical day. That's the contact exposure. And you can imagine that if you have a high interaction proximity and a high contact exposure, you're most exposed and it's probably the most unsafe area. 
So think about airports, public transportation, hotels, things, those types of areas. The protocols that have been defined for those type of uh, areas are very, very similar. Um, when it comes to professional working spaces, the call centers, the office environments, again, you'll see similar resolutions. So this really tells us that it's not one specific company or one specific sector protocol that's interesting. Actually, we need to think about these work environments when it comes also into thinking about what the new normal will look like. Because the new normal, working remote, looks very, we see a discussion popping up, particularly in professional working spaces, but not so much when it comes to isolated or solistic work because these people are working safely already. Let's move to the next slide. And I'll tell you more about what we feel these protocol insights uh, can help us establish what the new normal will look like. As the world charts a path towards the new normal, there are actually eight key topics that we felt are now being discussed for the longer term within companies for the three high contact proximity work environments one, two, and three year on the slide. And this is actually maybe even a stronger indicator than the labor market insights of who's being hired and who's firing within several se uh, sectors. Work environments where people do solicit work will not really change, we think. But they're probably not as interested to really think about the new normal but environments where we clearly see that we've installed protocols where people and workplaces really had to be changed, those are now all thinking about what this means for the longer term. In the first category, the professional working places, you'll definitely see that they're all looking into what should we do in the longer term when it comes to remote work? How do you strike the balance between work and life? Maybe we shouldn't just necessarily say work from home, but work remote. What does it mean if we actually have workers that work in another country? It's now possible. We've seen the change happen. Borderless becomes a good option, office work. In the second category, also to key topic, is when, for example, a protocol says, you need to clean the touch points every two hours. How do you organize this at a large, significant public interaction place like an airport or a theme park? We've seen examples of companies that announce in retail stores the safety procedures continuously to make sure that people know what to do. Many people also have a fear to work in these large uh, environments. And how do you deal with that? Companies with significant interaction all have employees assistance programs and they even offer professional counseling for difficult situations. In the large confined areas like factories and warehouses, we see that medical screening before entering is applied to ensure the safety of workers. Will this stay for the long term or do you, how do you handle that properly? Basically for all three categories, working in shifts and skilling the workplace for the future are common themes. And we really think that that is also predicts what the new normal will look like. MasterCard is now looking at consolidating some of its offices. Facebook has plans to work in hubs across the US. We've all had to adjust so very rapidly, and we've seen that in those protocols. So the question is, what will stick for the longer term? Digitization, skilling, creating agile teams, as well as data are common themes across the globe. What will my future and business look like? This is also very much reflected in our Talents Trends report that Louisa was just telling you about. So let's talk in the next slide about how ready you are for your new ways in your work environment. In all our connections with companies across the globe on the Safely Back to Work program, Ronsa really recommends that the following four organizational aspects are taken into account when you discuss your new ways of working. And Ronsat, of course, is always willing to support you in this, this journey. Um, where does the work happen? Is there a preference to work at the office? Or do you really consider to fully work remote? 
How are you organized? Is there a, a traditional pyramid structure in place? Or are you considering to really move to an agile structure? How are your decisions being made? But especially, what is your workforce size and the composition of the future to make you successful in your company? I'd like to hand back over to Louisa, and she can tell you much more on the research that Russell Sorsheit conducted on how capital leaders are leading the COVID-19 response and the future of work. Thanks so much, Ankur. And it was remiss of me at the start of the webinar. I didn't uh, say, please pop your questions through to us. If you have any questions, this panel would love to answer some questions. Uh, so before we uh, go into our panel conversation, we did have one. Uh, we will be sharing the materials from this webinar following, uh, uh, following our conversation today. Uh, it will include the presentation, uh, we will have the recording of the webinar, and we'll also uh, be able to share uh, a look at the overall protocols and the new talent trends report that we've had a look at the trends report moving forward. So if we go to the next slide, let's get this conversation with Ankur, Ali and Yvette underway. But I have a first conversation or a first question for the group. I see two people in offices today <laughs> and uh, one or two of us working from home. And uh, Ankur, I know that uh, you're in the uh, Randstad's Demon headquarters or Amsterdam headquarters. So tell me, what's it like being returning to the office? Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm, I must say the first day was actually also quite fearful for me, even though I knew what the office protocol looked like. Um, you are uh, a, yeah, a bit afraid. Will I like it? Not so much afraid from a safety perspective, but will I actually enjoy being there with so uh, yeah, less colleagues than what we're used to? Uh, but I must say for the past uh, uh, four weeks, I've been here once uh, a week. And it, it's very nice to have the combination of the flexibility I'm particularly enjoying. I, I feel safe here. And I also see that my colleagues uh, appreciate it when we do uh, are able to do a face-to-face -face meeting combined with all the uh, online uh, sessions that we're doing together. Yeah, and I think you know it's a great example of the application of the protocols. So uh, look forward to seeing us, uh, you know, all being able to return safely to work. And I think it's an example of, like you said, that flexibility of being able to book your shifts when you're there and knowing that uh, the protocols are in place. So we look forward to sharing those uh, with everyone after the webinar today. Uh, so again, please don't hesitate to pop any questions in the chat for our panel as we move to our trends section. Uh, but back in January 2020, uh, did you know as just looking at the date just then, and it is nearly the end of June. I think for many of us, it's like, where did that go? And, uh, you know, in terms of we have faced so much over the last uh, four to six months in a totally different uh, environment where we've been looking, how do we protect the welfare of our people? How do we uh, maintain or sustain or look for levels of business continuity? And uh, it's great to have Ali and Yvette with us today here as well, because they've been consulting and working with uh, major enterprise organizations across the world and how do you really uh, face this challenge and, and start to look towards what does the transformation look like for your workforce and moving forward in what will be our new normal moving forward. So yeah, we did uh, do a study and we released the Talent Trends Report in 2020, uh, January 2020 of this year. So it's amazing what can happen in six months. So we thought it's time to take a reflection. And we looked back at the trends that were produced at the end of, the next, uh, of last year to come into this year. Now, what the interesting fact came about of that is that in actual fact, we saw that six trends have only just been accelerated by um, the outcomes and what's happened, been happening over the last six months. And really, we thought it's a great time to take a reflection on, you know, what has been the impact um, of the pandemic on our workforce organisation and on structures, and how can we uh, look forward to where does that really create uh, potential new ways of working and structure. So uh, we aren't going to delve into all six today. Hey, we look forward to sharing the report with you following the session. Uh, but if we move to the next slide, we're going to have a look at uh, four of the big ones that we really think uh, can shape a really great conversation with the panel today. So that's uh, everything from looking at how do we build agile organisations uh, with an agile workforce? You know, how's that digital transformation reshaped workplace culture? We did conduct this session with our uh, colleagues and clients in Asia Pacific this morning. And, you know, a lot of questions come in, in terms of, you know, will we ever all go back to the office? And I think many HR leaders are, you know, having uh, great conversations with their people today in terms of what is that level of flexibility that Anka just mentioned and what will that new normal look like? Um, and as I say, it will some stage become the old normal. 
We do also know that data has redefined the labour market um, and that's that's probably is leading up to uh, the COVID pandemic. But I think e data has become even more critical to drive that business agility and that workforce agility as many organisations have looked uh, at, at incredible levels of either scaling up or really had to make difficult decisions on how they uh, manage their workforce through the crisis. And that leads through to the final trend, which will um, be a great discussion around you know, that um, wonderful thing, our global head of uh, talent marketing did a great webinar around this in sense of that, you know, talent never forgives nor forgets. And so providing an exceptional talent experience during these times is going to build your employer brand, not only for now, but critically for the uh, future, uh, when we all look to uh, engage, you know, nurture, engage and attract talent to organ our, our organisations. So let's uh, get ourselves <laughs> underway and started. Uh, you know, we, we do know that um, I thought this was a really interesting stat. So I, I should preface that this research was conducted in uh, very late last year. And so, you know, we could say in the world of what we've been through in the last six months, that is old. However, what is interesting if we look back is that at that time, a third of organisations said um, that if the economy were to worsen in the com uh, coming year, they would be pre uh, completely prepared. So what's, what about the rest of them? And then we have a crisis the size of the pandemic and we really have to start to challenge ourselves is how has this really reshaped our organisations and you know what does it look like today? So does your organisation have an agile workforce that is ready to be redeployed? How are you looking at your internal talent and really looking at where and how you'll be able to shift and adapt uh, to what the company needs today? And can you scale effectively um, up and down as needed? So I think this is a really uh, great question. And Yvette, I know you're having numerous amounts of conversations with customers about this. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this question. Yeah, you're right, Louisa. Thank you. And it's true. Um, as already shared by Anka, we have multiple conversations with our clients and agility is always one of the topics and now even more than in the past. I do not believe that I would say in the, as you rightly said, 20 years experience in this industry, I've seen agility level picking up this fast. It's really true that under pressure, everything becomes fluid at a certain moment. Uh, since the beginning of March, where I'm, I'm living in the Netherlands, so there it hits the van, I would say having chat contacts with clients at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning about planning systems uh, suddenly became the new normal. And I think the interesting part is that it was totally accepted for both. Um, speaking with clients, we soon arrive at the point that we see agility is, agility is not only an agile workforce, but also mental agility, physical agility, um, company agility, and also HR strategy agility. And that is where we have a lot of conversation around it. If you are talking about, I would say, HR agility, it's uh, also rethinking a uh, conversation about your internal mobility, uh, your internal capabilities. What do you have? Your internal flexibilities. How should your workforce be structured now and also after the, uh, after the COVID? It's the most common question I hear in discussions I have with the clients. And uh, in order to be ready for the new normal, um, I would advise as well the people who are on the call to think about your critical capacity. Maybe, you know, start recruiting for capacity instead of start recruiting for jobs. Um, bundle jobs you have and create packages of work. It's just a different way of engaging to labor. And this is the true agility, which you see now is, is speeding up uh, rapidly. More in the short term, um, I would say that companies who are leading are the ones who work with good scenario planning. We all know it's important, but the what if scenario is more, more important than ever. It means also investment. I've been in weekly calls with clients working on extreme scenarios, country by country, every single week. And I would say in my experience, the food industry did in particular a very, very good job. Uh, there were no huge surprises in planning. Everybody was fully prepared. Uh, everybody was agile, so the partners, but also the customer themselves and also the employees. Uh, what I liked about it in agility, if you looked at the onboarding, produ produ uh, the onboarding uh, producers they have, it was in the open air. We had remotely facility tours organizing. We had extra classes over the weekends and it worked. Surprisingly, it worked almost from day one. So at least I believe that nobody in the world was, um, uh, was out of chocolate and candies from this customer. So uh, <laughs> it looks like uh, they were okay. That's an interesting point you make. I did hear of it that uh, you know it's some of those things that always uh, generally increase under this level of crisis. And the love of chocolate is uh, is one thing that I don't. Yeah. <laughs> 
think there's yeah. always been a rise rise yeah. in. I did yeah. also, um, you know, I think we've had some really interesting examples with customers, just like you've mentioned, where, you know, one side of their business, there's been a very significant scaling down, while on the other side of their business, they've had a huge ramp up. And how do you look to um, internally mobilise critical talent that you could quickly reskill and redeploy to your other areas of your organisation? I think that's a really, really interesting thing that you've hit on. And also that fact in the thinking of how do you um, build for capabilities today? And maybe as we look to more flexible, agile workforces, you know, capabilities, you know, we, we may move from that level of contingent and permanent flex from what's probably been more, uh, you know, a 70 percent permanent staff, 30 percent contingent to even what we're seeing as 50 50. So Ali or Anka, do you have anything to add to those comments of Yvette? Yeah, I think uh, what I've definitely seen is that large companies also are agile uh, between different countries. If you uh, have certain workers that cannot work for uh, the country that they normally go to the office to, they now all service another uh, country which is part of the company. That's uh, fantastic to see that it's agility all across. Uh, we've seen, of course, great examples of the automotive industry. Um, uh, Ford, uh, Builder Dreams, uh, those type of companies have completely uh, changed their manufacturing environments from building cars to uh, building facial masks, respirators, uh, and actually supporting the crisis. That was, I think, a uh, fantastic uh, example of agility in general. So for me, what I clearly see from the companies that I've spoken to is that agility is also about prior technician. You don't know what's going to hit you next. So what's important now? What's the workforce that I need now? And tomorrow, I need to ask myself the same thing and make sure that I can adapt my workforce exactly to that high-speed, vo uh, volatile environment. And, and uh, an additional comment on that is we've also seen uh, customers who rely on additional partners to complete some of their tasks actually go out and uh, use their protocols and the things that they're learning to help bring their partners along the business uh, and, and share this information, share the best ways of working so that they can complete their supply chains, right? So um, yeah, I, I, I see so many companies coming together to really try to help um, show how they can be agile and making their business even one step farther than their own organization. It's unprecedented. And Ali, when you look at that, the level of learning that can can be achieved uh, in this type of environment. Uh, we all say, I guess it's uh, like being back in school, isn't it, where you do learn under pressure. Uh, and it's, but it's also really great to see how governments, uh, you know, institutions, companies are collaborating uh, to support each other at this point in time. So let's move through to the next trend, which is, you know, I, I think this comes as uh, no surprise to everyone, but, uh, you know, digital transformation has reshaped our workforce. Uh, but what was interesting was that uh, when we first surveyed late, late last year is 45% said that digital transformation was moving too fast and they couldn't keep up. I think many organizations today, and it's a, we know it's a meme that's a common meme around town that, you know, did the CIO drive digital transformation or is COVID-19 because organizations have very rapidly, rapidly changed. I think what's, um, you know, some of the really interesting articles I've recently read, one of them was by the CEO of Cisco, where he he talked about the, the notion now of borderless talent, that you can really construct highly networked cross-functional teams across borders today. And does it really matter where they sit in the world? And that'll be an interesting thing as we start to question what will the new normal look like as, you know, that flexibility of working remotely or needing to work in an office. So I'd love to hear from uh, you guys, you know, how did you, how do, how do have organized organizations really adjusted their corporate processes and culture to drive this new ways of working. So Ali, why don't you kick us off around this one? Sure, sure. Well, so um, it's interesting, right? So certainly uh, to get through this time in the world, every aspect of leadership has had to come together. Uh, but I would definitely say that uh, IT and digital teams are having their moment, right? So it's sort of the uh, the, the World Cup, I think, for our digital teams. And um, I had a conversation not too long ago with a customer, and you know, we, were, we were just chatting about the things that were going on. And we, we were talking about the fact that five years ago, we if this had occurred, we would have really been in, in the corporate world um, in, in a very, very difficult spot. And the fact that we have um, 
witnessed even in our own company um, and with most of our customers, the 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 move to, from the move of thousands of people to remote working in a matter of weeks. And so these are things that were uh, that were seemingly impossible that happened and happened almost without fault. You know, there, there are very, very few hiccups. Now and then we all have a, a Wi-Fi issue, but I really do think that uh, IT and digital teams are, are pulling us along nicely. And, I, and the conversations that I have with customers now are you know, what will be the new normal and how does technology continue to help us evolve uh, in that way? And um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing are do do we ever go back to traveling the way that we once did because we don't need to? And are we able to take those financial resources and apply them to other parts of our business? In the sales world, um, you know, it, it became apparent fairly quickly that it was going to be uh, a, a long process. You know, we could be talking about a year, we could be talking about two years, and does business completely stop? Well, we're not able to do that. So we're everybody's being very creative and using their technology we're continuing on with processes of uh you know, using digital ways to uh do site visits to understand what's happening in an environment with our customer where we can't be there face to face you can't send people around the world to do this um and and, and it's actually working extremely well uh, it does require uh prep in a different way uh, for for many companies, but we're getting that done. And um, what also is very interesting is being able to take things like AI and robotics and um, accelerate those, right? So you know, many of these things, like to, to, to the point of your meme, uh, Louisa, what moved it forward? Well, maybe COVID helped advance it, but the, the, the technology was there behind it to help give it a reason to move forward. Mm. And looking at what companies are doing to very quickly uh, do a large volume recruitment using AI and robotics, I think will absolutely be a wave of the future. And more and more customers are coming to us wanting to know more about that. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting shift. And Yvette, you mentioned that as well as that level of uh, technology innovation that um, continues to ensure organizations can attract, engage and nurture their talents. So I'd love to hear from either Yvette or Anka, is there any other great examples you've heard where organizations have really shifted and being, you know, accelerated their level of technology adoption to be able to enable the nurturing of their workforce? What I, what yeah. I found extremely interesting is how the digital transformation has taken such a leap in the educational sector. Um, I know for years that it's been uh, a topic on many schools, you know, should we be uh, in online uh, teaching sessions, uh, also at universities? Um, what will be the future? Uh, a lot of things are being done now online with online webinars, etc. But I think now in the past months, we've all seen we've had to have online education um, and of course everybody that is either advocating or criticizing uh, uh, online uh, training a school is much more than and then uh, a place where you learn things where, where a teacher teaches you things it's also a community with uh, with, with people, friends and and what the digital transformation that's ahead of this year is really thinking about how can we also make sure that that sense of community that cultural thing that that educational institutions find so important uh, remains for the future but it also solves actually a big issue that i think we have across the globe uh, there's a lot of a scarcity of good teachers uh, but online uh, teaching has shown us teacher can teach the class and teachers assistants can work with uh, teams on smaller groups or do things face to face and uh, to make sure that people understand. So that true shift, not only through digitization, but also the big question, you know, what does that mean for the future? And can digitization also support us on that cultural aspect is uh, especially seen in this sector. It's a growth yeah, mindset. I agree. And it's an interesting one, I guess, uh, you know, one of the other shifts is you know, with us, uh, a lot more of us working from home and that ability to, you know, that personal connection. I was mentioning to Anka that uh, my husband is a teacher and uh, it's been really interesting to watch that transformation to digital teaching and, you know, has, hasn't had any view into that before at this time and the impact that it can have, like you said, Anka, to keep that 
close connection and collaboration with students. So I, I do think that uh, it's a it's an, an amazing transformation that we should watch closely because I think it does also show that focus on community building and how to build community and building in a digitized environment, which is so important to culture. So I am going to move along to the next uh, next one, which is uh, focused on you know, how is data defining the labour market? And, you know, probably no surprise uh, to our human capital leaders with us today that, you know, large majority were already investing significantly or moderately in analytics capabilities. And, you know, I think it's kind of lucky that they were because, you know, as we look to how fast uh, the market transformed and how fast businesses had to react, it's a really uh, amazing combination of how do you use your data to produce insight to really like I think um, we talked about at the top of the calls, how do you create those scenarios of it? Like you know, how do we, you know, how do organizations use um, some insight to best predict what sort of scenarios do they need to think about to optimize how they manage their workforce? How are they connecting with their people? What does it look like in terms of your internal talent base? And how can you rapidly re redeploy where you need to? And unfortunately, where, where do you need to know that you may have overcapacity that you need to go, going to need to manage that workforce very well? So I'd love to hear from um, Yvette on this one. Let's kick start uh, with you because we yeah. skipped you on the last question. Uh, but no, does your no, organization okay. um, have sufficient internal talent and business uh, intelligence to conduct stronger workforce planning for the months ahead. Yvette, how have you seen, because I think you've seen some interesting things happening in customers this way. Yeah, I, I do see that. And I think in general, it, it, it takes, it goes much faster than everybody thought about it. Eh? And they realize now how important it is. I've worked for a long time in the specialists and logistics companies as well, where you know they are quite good in data because they need to manage their supply chain for the customers. I know a couple of them are also joining this, uh, uh, this session. But we all know that we have, once in a while, we have this planning night nightmare forecast nightmare because we all thought we knew the forecast and then the, something happens whatever it is and the forecast is totally off and we all need to organize and this is the constantly battle to have have this data in place and moreover i would say not only having the data in place but what to do with the data if you look at the the the, the vacancies for data analysts and all, all relevant type of uh, of everybody needs them and everybody wants them so i guess we we're arriving at a place that Quite a few companies have the data, still missing the visibility. So it's more like, what are you doing with the data uh, or data, whatever, which area of the world we are? And how are you really going to uh, translate that into your workforce and into your talent acquisition uh, uh, yeah, talent acquisition strategy in the end? And I think there it will, it will accelerate, 100% sure. And this is also what I see with the customers currently where I'm speaking to, like, okay, how do I get this visibility? How do we make it work? And how are we sure we are, again, coming back to the scenario planning? We have various scenarios and we can move forward in a rapid place. That would be my, uh, my main takeaway. Yeah, I completely agree. And it really links yeah. back strongly to the last yeah. two trends, doesn't it, yeah. in terms of, you know, if we, if we have the insight as to how do we need to drive areas of agility and I know you've yeah. got some interesting insight and feedback around this area too. So we'd love to hear your, your input on this one. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think the whole uh, presentation that I just showed you was about that, right? <laughs> Getting information <laughs> from companies. And also not think about things just yourself, not only brainstorming, but really quickly gathering information, looking into the insights and then sharing that with others. That's of course key. Um, as Yvette was saying, data analysts, those are very high in demand jobs. Well, I think it's one job you can definitely do remote. So uh, we can have uh, borderless data analysts to support all our companies in uh, in these uh, business uh, intelligence insights which are so crucial uh, what we've done uh, within uh, the Ronsop group we have uh, OC which is IT consultancy and solutions uh, uh, business line uh, they invested in creating an uh, AI tool where they popped in all the resumes and all the skills of their uh, current uh, consultants and they also looked at uh, what uh, are our customers asking for. And that really helped us to get insights into, you know, what do we have, the, well, not only the potential of our workforce, but also, also their ambition. What do they want to do as the next step to make sure that we align the consultants with what's actually being asked by our clients? Well, that was very insightful, very useful tooling, which we use. But now in this 
pandemic crisis, it was crucial because we immediately see that companies had taken different approaches, that, that other skills were much higher in demand. So this is where you see that you can really optimize your internal talent if you really look into the data. And I think that's uh, fantastic for other companies uh, to look into as well. So Ankara, I, I think that's really great. We actually have uh, so three of us who say data on the uh, call today, and one one Ali Demerol that says data. So you know, Ali, <laughs> that, uh, you're working with uh, many large organisations uh, today in terms of you know how could do you combine that level of internal knowledge and insight in your talent and with the external market as well as you know business intelligence and where to shape and shift your strategy. So tell me some of the things that uh, you're hearing and learning on the ground. Uh, well, I, I think that people are um, yeah, taking a look at really redoing everything, right? So, yeah, are are they challenging uh, the? And when I say the old thoughts, by old I mean six months ago uh, about yeah, what pre, what is pre COVID. It? It's not that long, huh? That's right. That's right. And it really is a very short period of time with so much transformation. And uh, and I, I really do think that. Uh, we see companies using data from every direction and every company is pushing so hard right now to gather as much data as possible so that they can make a very constructive, valuable um, decision or temporary decision based on what they know. And so the fluidity of what comes in is really based on what we continue to know about the disease, uh, about how it's going to impact supply. What do supply chains look like? What do we need? That data comes in every single day and it's that flexibility of utilizing that data to, to, to quickly go back and be agile, going back to the first point. Ali Falou Green, if you look at our own organization, I know the level of uh, data that's being collated on a daily and uh, weekly basis to help uh, you know, lead us steer the business uh, and be able to support and develop our workforce through this time is really quite incredible. So I do think for HR leaders out there today, uh, data is playing a very important role in the past. I think what's brilliant in terms of what we learn moving towards the future um, and, you know, hopefully into that world where there is post-COVID is that it's it really creates a very strong link for HR to be helping to drive business forward. So I uh, do see that this is something that will only continue to accelerate and transform. So let's move to our final uh, trend of today. And I think this is, again, uh, a really interesting one. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's something that we always have to keep a very strong focus on. And I think, you know, when we look at it, 72% of human capital leaders, uh, leaders believe strong company values are a top factor in attracting, engaging and retaining talent. And I think uh, there has been no time uh, in history, you know, for all of us in terms of how critical values to an organisation are and managing your employer brand during a time of crisis. Uh, like mentioned uh, at the top of the call, you know, it's it's a time when talent will never uh, forgive nor forget uh, what has happened <laughs> during this time and it's critical for us all to take important steps. Some of the really heartening stories I think we've already mentioned for organisations like Ford, Honeywell, who have quickly turned um, in their strategies to be producing uh, very meaningful uh, materials to support uh, not only our communities but the people who have supported um, the healthcare workers right throughout the world is uh, really incredible and it's amazing in terms of um, the impact that that can have on uh, the community response to your brand. At the same time, I've heard really amazing stories where, you know, in terms of when we look at that increased need for customer service and call centre operators in our marketplace, it's really it created greater accessibility work. So if you look at the technology transformation, uh, it's it's provided access to people with disabilities, for an example, that haven't be, have been restricted from working um, in a workplace for many years. And I was reading a wonderful story about someone who'd been out of the uh, out of work for twenty years, and, and this has enabled them to be in work. So I think it also increases our reach uh, to critical talent pools that uh, we can keep nurturing and developing into the future. And then, and then we hear, you know, organisations unfortunately have uh, needed to uh, look at where they would need to unfortunately uh, let, have people transition and exit from their business. And, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys on the ground, you know, what are some really great examples of where you see that customers have uh, taken very positive mm -hmm. steps to ensure that their talent experience is uh, so high and, and, and critical to their business at this time. So. I'm going to throw it out to the audience. Uh, I think, Ali, you want to get this one started and we'll hear from both Ankara and Yvette. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and what I see from the 
And I, I think so many companies are doing a really nice job of this uh, and absolutely talk about uh, your, the value in the market, uh, but the communication back to your employees, what you're saying to them and the frequency with which you do that is very, very important. Uh, and, I, and I think that it, it, it's twofold, right? So companies are having to continue to hire. And so if it's unsettling to those of us who are fortunate to retain our jobs during this crisis, think about how unsettling it is to actually be out there looking for a job. And uh, yeah, a part of that is communicating how things are going to work, um, following through on, on commitments with your talent. If you, if you have to have uh, some type of a, a, a delay in your hiring processes, it needs to be clearly communicated because people just, you know, they're, they're sitting at home and they don't know. So that in order to retain your employer brand, as you move forward, you've got to really clearly communicate mm -hmm. talent where, where, um, where you stand with things. And the biggest part uh, that I'm seeing, this is, this is me leader, as well as a professional in the industry is flexibility. And I'm sure that we could we could sit on this call and have coffee over another hour and I'll share stories <laughs> of ourselves, uh, about uh, the challenges people are, are seeing that our employees are seeing in balance and work life. I think gone is you know, the nine to five work schedule. Um, you know, many of us are when we can, where we can and the best way that we can. And um, being able to talk to talent that are coming into your organization, they, they're, they're all very, very worried about Will they be able to continue on um, taking care of their families in a new in a new position? Thanks, Ali and Devet. Um, you know, I know that uh, you've uh, been working with companies around this too, so I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, there are plenty of examples actually I could use because uh, yeah, did, everybody's looking at their brand currently, and especially during a crisis. Uh, you're very right with saying won't forget and uh, won't forgive and won't forget. It's it's either the one or the other, and there's nothing in between, I would say. And companies are more and more aware of that. Um, when COVID hit, uh, we saw obviously many organizations, they went immediately in a uh, in hiring freeze. This is what happens currently. Uh, however, the way they did it was very different. And uh, uh, I know of one big telecom company, actually, who, who honored almost every pending offer, which was still uh, on the shelf and worked on it and, and did a good job in that. And this became so well known just through the world of mouth. Uh, so if you're looking at that country where that company was working at that time, it is a great, great experience. And providing this great experience to the people, uh, yeah, it, it helps you tremendously in your branding. Another good and more practical example I've seen with uh, many of our clients is uh, COVID bonuses being paid out. So really respecting the employees who suddenly had to work in different shifts, different work, uh, indeed from Ford changing from, uh, you know, being a manufacturer in a car to suddenly do something totally different, um, uh, facing maybe insecurity, going to the office or going to a production plant. But having these bonuses paid out is really appreciation of your customer, of, of your, uh, sorry, of your employees. I would say be consistent and treat everybody with dignity and respect times like this even if hard decisions have to be made, because you uh, see, unfortunately, every single day, and probably it won't stop yet. Still make sure those people will feel support. Uh, I think an example which has been uh, viral quite heavily is, is of Airbus, uh, so I think I can, uh, I can mention it. It's a good example of how you can bring such a message. So if anybody haven't seen it, I'm sure you can find it online, but the way the message is brought, it doesn't change the actual fact, but it definitely changed the brand company. Um, lastly, I would say a more general tip. It comes from a, a, a conversation I had with an IT company where we went back a little bit back to the protocol and the communication in the protocols. And they had a really clear vision on how to communicate uh, for all the employees what was happening. And then we discussed, okay, how are you doing it with your contingent work? And then the contingent work was okay because they had partly agencies behind it. But then again, you rely on the agency, how they communicate it. But they had a big chunk of independent workers there. And basically at that moment, they said, yeah, you're right. Actually, we, we, we stay to the, to, the, to the business unit manager, like, okay, make sure you bring the message. But if you have a strict, do it for the total workforce. It really makes a big difference. So that's that's a really good examples. point. And I, yeah. 
Yeah, I think at this time, you know, we've gone through, we've learned about the protocols today, we've translated that into yeah. how it's, uh, you know, reshaping and transforming our workforces for the future. But I think at the end of the day, it's all about um, it, protecting the welfare of people. Uh, so no matter what we talk about in yeah. terms of shifts and trends and uh, what's happening uh, with uh, the, you know, the ongo ongoing environment that we're working and living in, it's, it's protecting the welfare of our people. And, and, and no matter where they work, how they work or um, where they are in their personal circumstances, right now so i think that's a wonderful note to end on ali you're right we probably could spend another hour on all these uh <laughs> wonderful topics today but we are at the end of the hour and i know that uh, people are getting back to their next meetings and uh back to work we will share the recording uh, of the session together with the protocol materials and the uh, new talent trends report uh, i want to say a big thank you to everyone that has joined us and a big thank you to our panel today um, I truly believe we could have kept going <laughs> for another hour. I feel like I'm cutting us off. Uh, so I do thank you. And uh, we will be taking a short hiatus from our, our webinar series and coming back uh, after the European summer to and uh, share, uh, you know, a good, really great view into what are really the new ways for talent executives uh, as we start to shift and really engage in what the new normal looks for us. So again, thank you to everyone and I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in September. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.